There's so many wonderful memories. Uh, <laughs> every time you would win a game or get a base hit that won a game, you know, that was a thrill of a lifetime. And, uh, oh, I had a lot of wonderful thrills. I, I was never a great ball player, but I loved the game. And I think my greatest thrill was putting the pirate uniform on and going, coming up at, at a young age and, and getting to know these fellas personally was the well, great thrill. I probably think the whole 60 team because uh, they're a group of guys that didn't have the greatest talent in the world, didn't have the most talent in uh, baseball at the time, but uh, we ended up a winner because I think uh, we, did the, we, we did the little things well. We did all the little things. 1971, we were coming back from Baltimore after winning the World Series. And they positioned us in these convertibles. We were going to parade across the bridge coming into Pittsburgh. I had never seen so many people in my entire life. And as we start the parade going across the bridge, just when we... There were a lot of things that I can remember, but uh, I trained in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And in 1978 and 9, we went to Hot Springs. And then... I think uh, my fondest memory involved people, the players and the people in Pittsburgh. Uh, my wife and I spent 22 years in Pittsburgh, and the people were just great. And the players that I was associated with in Pittsburgh were equally great. The Battlin' Bucks. The first hundred years of the Pittsburgh Pirates. My most vivid pirate memory has to be Bill Mazeroski's home run sailing over this wall to beat the Yankees in the 1960 World Series. Hello, I'm Reed Kordick. And these ivy-covered bricks are just about all that's left of Forbes Field. They stand now as a symbol of tradition, because over the course of a century, the Pittsburgh Pirates have built one of the most colorful and compelling traditions in all of sport. This is the story of their first 100 years, the history of the Battlin' Bucks. In 1887, Grover Cleveland was president of the United States. Pittsburgh was a bustling city of some 200,000 people, and a local baseball team called the Alleghenies officially joined the National League. The Alleghenies had formed in 1876, but their nickname didn't change until 1890. The Pittsburgh team in that league was known to sign players from another league, and they were known as pirating these players. So as a Pittsburgh team got known as the Pirates, and it sort of stuck. In 1891, the Pirates began playing in Exposition Park, near the site now occupied by Three Rivers Stadium. But the Pirates had little success until a German immigrant named Barney Dreyfus purchased the ball club and merged it with his Louisville team. He somehow got interested in going to ball games. He bought an interest in the Louisville club. And from then on, that was just his whole life's work because that was what he loved. And uh, he brought the Louisville Club into Pittsburgh, the 1st of January, 1900. Under new player manager Fred Clark, the Pirates were National League champions in 1901, 2, and 3. And then Dreyfus made history. And in 1903, Boston won in the American League and Pittsburgh won in the National League. And my father called Mr. Killalay, who was president of the Boston Club, and asked him if he didn't think it would be a good idea if they played a series. And that was the beginning of the World Series. A one-page contract spelled out the guidelines for the first and only nine-game World Series. The Pirates went up three games to one, but Boston came storming back to take the next four games and capture the championship behind a pitching staff led by the immortal Cy Young. Despite the loss, Fred Clark maintained a standard of excellence. He managed the Pirates for 16 years and won more than 1,400 games and was inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame. Of course, it helped to have a player like Honus Wagner. 
Born in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, Wagner is considered the greatest shortstop of all time. He led the league in hitting eight times, finished with a career batting average of 329, and was an original member of the Hall of Fame. He was one of the greatest. There's no question he was one of the greatest. I tell you, he had one trick that nobody else has ever done. He could time a runner running to first base so that he beats him by that much. He had the greatest timer that I ever saw. My father, of course, pointed him out to me. And I saw him make a barehanded stop and throw one time, and that really impressed me. Of course, he had tremendous hands. He wouldn't have believed his hands. With the Flying Dutchman leading the way, the Battling Bucks won a team record 110 games in 1909 and went to the World Series for the second time. Their opponents were the Detroit Tigers, setting up a confrontation between the two greatest players of that era, Honus Wagner and Ty Cobb. The 1909 World Series began at brand new Forbes Field, which had opened its gates on June 30th of that year. Built in less than four months in the Oakland section of Pittsburgh, Forbes Field was a marvel of its time, the first ballpark ever constructed entirely of concrete and steel. The teams traded wins through the first six games of the series, with Wagner batting 333 to Cobb's 231. Game seven was played in Detroit, and the Bucks ran away with it. Both of Pittsburgh's home runs in the series were hit by player manager Clark, but the real hero was a rookie pitcher named Babe Adams, who won three games, including the seventh, as the Bucks captured their first world championship. Even with stars such as Wilbur Cooper, the team's all-time leader in wins with 202, it would be 16 years before the Pirates returned to the series. Meanwhile, the United States would enter a world war in which thousands of Pittsburghers would serve. While back at home, both coal miners and steel workers would engage in unsuccessful strike efforts. The world was changing fast and radio was at the forefront. Pittsburgh's KDKA was the country's first station. And in 1921, a Pittsburgh-Philadelphia game called on KDKA by Harold Arlen was the first baseball broadcast. One year later, Bill McKechnie was named manager of a promising pirate team with a young third baseman named Harold Joseph Trainer, more commonly known as Pi. The veteran leader of the team was Max Carey, a rugged outfielder and future Hall of Famer. In 16 seasons with the Pirates, Carey led the league in stolen bases 10 times. With future Hall of Famer Kai Kai Kyler also emerging as a star in the early 20s, the Pirates were once again one of baseball's best teams. And in 1925, Pittsburgh won the National League pennant. The 25 World Series opened at Forbes Field against the defending world champion Washington Senators. Despite Max Carey's phenomenal 458 batting average in the series, the Bucks fell behind three games to one. But they battled back to win the next two and then faced Walter Johnson in the seventh game at Forbes Field. We got behind uh, four to nothing before we recovered and Walter Johnson was pitching against us. And of course, Walter Johnson was the greatest in the American League uh, for many years. The big moment in the game was when we were tied in the eighth inning and Kyler, our right fielder, was at bat with the bases full and two out and he kept fouling off pitches. I'll never forget the anguish we went through when he fouled off all those pitches. Eventually, he hit a ball down the right field line, which was fair, and it bounded over in back of the canvas, and everybody scored. Well, of course, it was a ground rule, and they eventually put two men back on base. That made it nine to seven, Pittsburgh. That's the way it finished. Kyler's clutch hit made the Pirates world champions for the second time. High trainer also had a standout series, batting 346, but then Trainer stood out for 17 years as a Pirate player. His career 320 average was just one reason why he made the Hall of Fame, because Pi was also one of the best third basemen of all time. 
The one saying that covered trainers fielding was, one of the writers coined this, so-and-so doubled down the third base line and trainer threw him out. My trainer, he, he would have played for nothing. He loved baseball so well. I remember we had uh, several double headers in a row. Wow. And I, I was in the dressing room and came out with Pi. And he says, you know what? We just got one game today. He says, I'll get fat playing one game. <laughs> Trainer led the Pirates back into the World Series in 1927. But standing in the way were Babe Ruth and the New York Yankees. Ruth and Lou Gehrig were their chief assassins in a lineup called Murderer's Row, considered the best team ever. Ruth blasted the only two home runs of the 27 series, and the Yankees swept the Pirates in four straight games. And so at the end of their first 40 years, the Battlin' Bucks had been to four World Series and won two producing some of the finest players the game has ever known. were in full swing with flappers and dance marathons. But in 1929, the stock market crash brought tough times. Unemployment hit Pittsburgh hard, and the death of owner Barney Dreyfus in 1932 was a big blow for the Pirates. Son-in-law William Benswanger took over as president of the team, and in 1934, he appointed Pi Trainer as manager. The Bucks were a contending team through most of the 30s, thanks largely to the Wayner brothers. Paul spent 15 seasons with the Pirates, compiling a batting average of 340 and leading the league in hitting three times. It was Paul who suggested the Bucks take a look at younger brother Lloyd, a 319 hitter over 14 seasons in Pittsburgh. We got uh, Paul first, and uh... He, he was an excellent player. And then he said, oh, he said, my brother, I have a brother, that was it, who's a much better player than I am. So my husband went out to scout the brother and decided maybe Paul was right. So they signed up Lloyd, and the two were really quite a team, little poison and big poison. Lloyd was faster, and uh, uh, he was faster and was a real good center fielder, one of the best, And uh, but Paul, he was a good outfielder, but he didn't have the speed Lloyd did. If he'd had Lloyd's speed, he'd have probably had 400 every year. Big Poison and Little Poison. They played side by side in the outfield, and at the plate, they terrorized National League pitchers as no other brothers ever had. In fact, to this day, the Wainers remain the only brothers enshrined in baseball's Hall of Fame. They were poison to the pitchers. Dizzy Dean hated them. He hated to see them come up. L. Wainer, P. Wainer, Vaughn, and Trainer. Those were the. That was uh, that was our little murderers row. L. Wainer, P. Wainer, Vaughn, and Trainer. Right in the middle was Archie Vaughn, who was in the middle of many a pirate rally throughout the 1930s. In his 10 seasons with the Bucks, Archie compiled a batting average of 324. And just like the other three, Vaughn is in the Hall of Fame. He also shined in the field as one of the finest shortstops of his time. He did everything. He was a great fielder, great throw, accurate, and, uh, fast, and uh, he hit in a lot of runs. What more can you say? Once he caught that ball, he'd throw you out. But he was a great uh, ball player, very humble, and 
and uh, but one of the great hitters. And a key member of one of the most imposing offensive lineups in the major leagues. In 1936, Franklin Roosevelt was elected to his second term as president, and Pittsburgh suffered the worst flood in its history, cresting at more than 46 feet. Meanwhile, Pirate first baseman Gus Sewer was compiling a consecutive games played streak of 822, a league record at the time. Sewer and his teammates witnessed history in May of 1935, when Babe Ruth came to town as a Boston Brave, and in one game hit the last three homers of his career. The Bucks won the game, but Babe's final homer was the first ever to clear the Forbes Field roof. In the late 30s, ominous events abroad overshadowed baseball, and with World War at hand, the steel mills of Pittsburgh fired up in full force. St. Louis Hall of Fame player Frankie Frisch was named manager of the Bucks in 1940, but had only moderate success through the war years. And the end of World War II saw the beginning of a new era for the nation, the city, and the pirates as well. In 1946, Pittsburgh was thriving, but after 46 years, the Dreyfus family decided to sell the Pirates. People uh, who came in uh, made it very uh, important because Frank McKinney was a uh, very well-known person in Indianapolis. Of course, Bing Crosby was Bing Crosby. John Galbraith was John Galbraith, and Tom Johnson, of course, local all well-known people and it was a big lift here when that uh, came to pass because we were sort of in the doldrums in 46. The new owners signed former Detroit star Hank Greenberg in 47 to help revitalize the team. And in 48, longtime pirate broadcaster Rosie Rosewell was joined in the booth by a flamboyant 31-year-old named Bob Fritz, who had become a star in his own right. Also in 48, rookie skipper Bill Meyer led the Bucks to 83 wins and was named Manager of the Year. But the coming seasons were fraught with failure and frustration, except for Ralph Kiner, one of the greatest home run hitters of all time. He blasted 301 in seven and a half seasons as a Pirate and was a gate attraction all to himself. The people used to wait till Kiner came to bat his last time. See, we didn't have good teams at that time, not top teams. And then after Kiner batted the last time, you would see an exodus. People would get up and leave. They, all they wanted to see was him. I did have that reputation, and of course there, there was one reason for that. The, the Pirates were not a good ball club, and I was hitting a lot of home runs, and I was leading the league in home runs, and people would come out to watch that. And I take uh, great pride in the fact that uh, I put a lot of people in the ballpark, and I think that's really a, a great measure. Twice he belted more than 50 homers in a season, the only player in baseball history to lead his league in home runs seven consecutive years. Ralph Kiner is enshrined in the Hall of Fame. In 1952, Branch Rickey was hired as general manager. He'd built great teams in St. Louis and Brooklyn, but the task ahead of him in Pittsburgh was enormous. The challenges when he came over to Pittsburgh were great. The biggest disappointment I know that he had when he came over, he thought that it would be a fairly quick turnaround of the Pittsburgh franchise, but when he got over here, he found the minor leagues were almost completely void of talent, and it took longer. Ricky helped lay the groundwork for future success, but for eight straight seasons from 1950 through 1957, the Pirates won no more than 66 games and finished no higher than seventh place. 
in an eight-team league, according to our statistics, we should have finished ninth. So that's how bad we were. We'd find a different way to lose every night. I mean, it was exciting. A fly ball would go up. We didn't know who was going to catch it, if somebody was going to catch it. But the Pittsburgh club in 52, even though we lost a lot of games, they always thought they could win. And all the fans wanted in those years, like all good fans, show us that you're trying and hustling. And they stuck with us. The Bucks kept battling and their fans' loyalty was soon to be well rewarded. Changes began to occur that would catapult the team back to the top, and the first came in 1956 when Ricky retired. When Mr. Ricky stepped aside, we said, okay, who do we work with? And, and here's this young man who was working in New Orleans as the head of our farm club down there, and we said, Joe Brown is not only committed, but a very bright and able guy, and let's give him a shot at it. And so we brought Joe up, and the record shows he built one of the finest organizations in all of baseball. Good things began happening at the ballpark. In late May of 1956, Pirate first baseman Dale Long set a major league record by blasting home runs in eight consecutive games. Danny Murtaugh was appointed manager late in the 57 season. And almost instantaneously, the Bucks became winners. They'd gone a dreadful 36 and 67 before Murtaugh took over that season, but went 26 and 25 the rest of the way under Danny. The scrappy former second baseman for the team lit a fire under these Bucks, and in 1958, they were the surprise of baseball, winning 84 games to finish in second place. At the end of the 58 season, Joe Brown was honored as Major League Baseball's Executive of the Year. The thing that I liked best of all was that we had pretty much captured Pittsburgh. Uh, the people now knew that we had a good club, that we had talent, and that we were competitive. Before the 59 season began, Brown made a trade with Cincinnati that would prove to be crucial. Oh, unquestionably the best trade was the one which gave us Harvey Haddix, Don Hoke, and Burgess. Addicts gave us the starting left-hander we needed. Hope gave us a good hitter and a fine defensive third baseman. Smokey Burgess gave us a left-hand hitting catcher, which we needed. The Bucks fell back a bit in 59 and finished fourth. But on the night of May 26th in Milwaukee, perhaps the greatest one-game pitching performance in baseball history was achieved by Pirate newcomer Harvey Haddix, who did not allow a single Braves batter to get on base through 12 innings. But the one thing that I didn't realize, and I didn't know it until afterwards, that I hadn't walked somebody somewhere along the line. I was out there just trying to win a ball game. I didn't care about the base hits or not. We was trying to win. The Pirates had 12 hits, but could not score a run. So Haddix carried his perfect game into the bottom of the 13th inning. Here's the pitch. There's a fly ball deep right center. That ball may be on through and over everything. It is gone. Hold on. Absolutely fantastic. Joe Adcock spoiled the unparalleled performance. No other pitcher has ever tossed 12 perfect innings of baseball, but Haddix handled the disappointment with typical class and dignity. He sat at his locker, and there's all the press around him. And Harvey looked around, and he said, gentlemen, give me a moment or two, will you? And he said to the clubhouse, boy, bring me a beer. He sat there with his back to them, popped his beer, and took a couple of swigs of it. And goodness knows what went through his mind. But he turned around with a smile on his face, and he said, now, gentlemen, what can I do for you? I'll never forget that as long as I live. Pirate fans were treated to still more unforgettable pitching that season as reliever Elroy Face went 18 and 1 out of the bullpen. Face made the fork ball famous, and for 14 years, he was the buck stopper. Well, as far as I'm concerned, there hasn't been anybody that, uh, that has been as effective as Roy as in a relief role. Uh, bases loaded, nobody out more than once. The bases were still loaded and three out. In the summer of 1960, Pittsburgh was swept away by pennant fever, and a three-word slogan caught the spirit of the entire city. The 
the 60 season was, was the greatest thrill for me because very early on our team established a pattern. We were never out of any game. I think we won over 45 games after the seventh inning that year. It was a team of destiny. Yes, Mutts are going all the way, all the way, all the way. Yes, Mutts are going all the way, all the way this year. That's exactly what they did, winning 95 games to capture their first pennant in 33 years. Spearheading the charge was a pitching staff that featured names like Friend and Haddix and Mizell. But the main man with a 20 and 9 record in 1960 was Vern Law, who won the Cy Young Award that year. Vern Law was our stopper. I mean, uh, we could lose. In fact, in 1960, I think we never did lose four straight. He pitched every fourth day, and uh, if we had a losing streak going, he stopped it. And uh, he wouldn't let us get into any ruts. The tandem of Danny Murtaugh and Joe Brown had put together a proud and cohesive unit. All 25 Pirates carried the load of leadership, but none any more so than Dick Grote, a native of Wilkinsburg, who anchored the infield at shortstop. Grote spent nine seasons in a Pirate uniform, and 1960 was the finest of his career. He led the league in hitting with a 325 average, and at season's end was voted league MVP. On September 25th in Milwaukee, the Pirates clinched the pennant. They just won it. It's all over. They've got the report down there, Paul. The Pirates win it. The Pirates have won. It's all over. The Pirates have won the National League pennant on the basis of uh, the Cardinals losing to the Chicago Cubs at Wrigley Field. It's all over. Uh, I wish I had words to express how I do feel. Uh, I mean, that's something you just can't put into words. We've been waiting so doggone long for this that I think that everyone is just tickled pink. Well, now, how about it? You feel is the pitching is the big thing, uh, Danny, in any ball club and this one? Well, uh, I think we're, we're rather blessed. Danny, that's, that's uh, sort of a sample of what's going to happen if you win the World Series. How about that? Oh, my, I'm for it 100%. The memorable thing to me was when we came back to Pittsburgh. Uh, downtown Pittsburgh was jammed. Chamber of Commerce uh, provided uh, convertible cars, and the people just were ecstatic. It was like VJ Day and VE Day and New Year's Eve and everything else combined. It was a moving experience. It, I think, was typical of the kind of support that Pittsburgh gives you when you're good. The eyes of the nation focused on the World Series opener at Forbes Field as the Bucks were set to battle the mighty New York Yankees. In game one, Roy Face came on for the save after seven strong innings by Vern Law, who got credit for the 6-4 win. But the Yankees hitters exploded to crush the Bucks in the next two games, winning 16-3 at Forbes Field and then 10-0 at Yankee Stadium giving New York a two games to one lead in the series. The Pirates were counting on Vern Law to come back and stem the tide in game four. We got to stop this right now. You know, I mean, it's, uh, we can't have, you know, we just can't give them the edge right now. We've got to shut it off. And, uh, and fortunately, we were able to do that. I got a double play ball uh, that first inning, able to get out of the inning without them scoring. And uh, then I felt like we were back in control at that point. Once again, it was Elroy to the rescue. Law departed after six and a third innings with the Pirates ahead three to two. And that's the way it stayed thanks to Face, who registered his second save of the series with some fine defensive support from center fielder Bill Verdon. With the series now tied at two games apiece, Face was fast becoming a national celebrity. Well, now the Yankees have been feeling very nervous because you've been throwing at them a fork ball. I'd like you to illustrate what a fork ball is so the country can understand it when they read well, about it. Well, I hold it between my first two fingers like that mm -hmm. without any seams, and I throw it straight overhand like the fastball, and the ball will usually sink. I think that's unfair to our organized Yankees. I really do. It's awfully nice to have you here. Red. Um. The series remained in New York for Game 5. The Pirates drove home five runs, while starting pitcher Harvey Haddix allowed only two over six and a third innings, before giving way to Face, who shot down the Yankees for his third save. 
and the Bucks headed home needing one more win. But in Game 6, New York romped again 12 to nothing, setting up perhaps the most compelling game in series history. The Bucks took a 4 to nothing lead, but the Yankees came back to go up by 3 heading into the last of the 8th. Gino Samoli was on first when the big break came. Bill Burden's bad hop grounder hit Tony Kubek in the throat, and instead of a double play, the Pirates had new life. They pushed across a pair of runs and had two men on base with two out when reserve catcher Hal Smith stepped up to the plate. And the 2-2 to Smith. He swings a long fly ball deep to left field. I don't know. It might go out of here. It is going, going, gone. Forbes Field is at this moment an outdoor insane asylum. We have seen and shared in one of baseball's great moments. When I got to second base, it dawned on me what had happened. And then I started getting pretty thrilled. It was really great coming around third and going into home. Dick Grote and Roberto Clemente were on base, and they were there waiting for me and greeting me. I don't know how anything could be any more exciting to any athlete than that, because that's the top. When we scored those five runs in the eighth inning, I think uh, we thought we had it won, and we just uh, went kind of crazy and feel like we just go through the motions, get them on, and we got this thing won. But it didn't happen that way. New York tied it with two in the ninth, and Mazeroski led off for the Bucks. All I can think to myself is just get a good ball, hit a line drive somewhere, get on base, get something started. So that was on my mind. I had no visions of hitting a home run, not, try, not even trying to hit a home run. Then. Ralph Terry delivered. lost composure and and started jumping around like crazy and throwing my hat around and uh, I don't know I just went a little crazy and I never did show my emotions on the ball field before and uh, but I had to that time who could blame him Bill Mazeroski had hit what is arguably the most dramatic home run in baseball history you just can't appreciate when you've got 40 50,000 people watching you play and you have never been in baseball before and then to win the World Series against the Yankees, of all people, you'd have to say that's the greatest moment you've probably ever had. The Batland Bucks had overcome the odds to win the World Championship after a wait of 35 years, and Pittsburgh went absolutely wild. In the early 1960s, more than 600,000 people lived in Pittsburgh, and downtown was rapidly building up. But the Bucks were breaking down as many of their stars became aging veterans. After the 64 season, Danny Murtaugh stepped down because of ill health, and Joe Brown was forced to rebuild. I'd say what Joe's greatest claim is that he built the team when it went down in the mid-60s. He brought it back up. And he's responsible for that team of the 70s. But throughout the 60s, Pirate fans could count on a few constants, like second baseman Bill Mazeroski. Turning the double play at second base, you won't find anyone quicker or finer. The ball looked like it made a U-turn. It didn't stop. You know, it just kept on going. And that's, uh, you know, just one of the finest players that ever played second base. He was an outstanding player, and I really believe he'd he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Roberto Clemente also starred throughout the 60s and was named league MVP in 66. 
Clementi was the first of several Latin players recruited to the Pirates. With an infusion of new talent in the late 60s, the Bucks were ready to battle their way back to the top, especially with Willie Stargell having already established himself as one of the game's great power hitters. From 1964 through 1979, Stargell slammed at least 20 homers in all but one season, and his 475 career home runs are tied for 15th place all time. In 1970, Danny Murtaugh returned as manager and guided the Bucks to the top of the East. But the team would raise its division flag at a brand new ballpark called Three Rivers Stadium, which became the Pirates' home on July 16th. Forbes Field had been home for 61 years, but had deteriorated so badly that it was time to move on. And on June 28th, the Bucks said farewell to Forbes with a doubleheader sweep of Chicago. Round ball, bouncing up the middle. Taken by Naz, he steps on second for the final putout in the history of Forbes Field. So it was goodbye to the past and hello to the future. And the pirate future was bright indeed. Playing in their new home in late September of 70, the Bucks swept a three-game series from the New York Mets to clinch the Eastern Division title. The 1970 playoffs ended in Cincinnati, where the Reds completed a three-game sweep of the Pirates. But at season's end, Murtaugh received Manager of the Year honors in a classic presentation by Casey Stengel. But here, I want you to take that gift and listen. I might be fooling up here, but you run me out of baseball. And I want to tell you something, you are slicker than they think you are. <laughs> In 1971, the Pirates would not be denied as they sailed off with their second straight Eastern Division crown. Sparking the charge was Willie Stargell, who posted single season career highs in home runs with 48 and RBIs with 125, while batting 295. Stargell's power was the perfect complement to a 341 average posted by Clemente as the Bucks won 97 games. As the season wore on, we just we were pounding people. I mean, uh, guys were fighting for the ball to see who would start that night. You know, give me the rat. I want the white rat. And uh, it was a great club to, to play for because we did. It, it started looking like, hey, we, we are good. You know, we've got a good ball club here. And uh, then it just becomes fun. And to, to pitch in front of that ball club, I was just happy that I signed with the Pirates because I wouldn't want to be in the National League with another ball club against that, that kind of hitting. The playoffs began in San Francisco, and first baseman Bob Robertson lit up candlestick. Robertson on a slasher down the right field line. Kingman leaps for it, gets a goodbye. It bounced off his glove and went on over the right field. Looking and is going, going, gone. Number three in this ball game by Bob Robertson. What a day he's having. Relief ace Dave Justy was on the mound at Three Rivers as the Pirates blew past the Giants three games to one and headed back to the World Series after an 11-year hiatus. The series opened in Baltimore, and the Orioles were heavily favored to win their second straight world championship. Earl Weaver's team had it all. Overwhelming pitching and overpowering hitting. Both were on display in the first two games. The O's took the opener 5-3, wrapping out 10 hits to Pittsburgh's mere three. And Baltimore ran away with the second game 11-3, out hitting the Pirates 14-8. They got us 2-0 real quick. And it was amazing, too, because the vendors there in Baltimore started selling uh, pirate paraphernalia at half price. They just knew that the Pirates wasn't coming back. And boy, I'm telling you, they, uh, they really wrote us off. After the second game, Murtaugh very calmly just told the media, you have not seen the real Pittsburgh Pirate team, but I'm sure you will see them before this series is over. And we'll be back. The scene shifted to Pittsburgh for game three, where Steve Blass grounded the O's with a masterful three to one victory. I didn't sleep too well <laughs> the night before that. Uh that third game, but uh, went out and just just had a whale of a ball game. Pitched a three-hitter. 
There's a drive right down to Cash on a short hop. The Buckos win. Look at Blanche. Game four in Pittsburgh made series history. This is the Golden Triangle of Pittsburgh, and there's a light on tonight. The fourth time in the history of the city of Pittsburgh as all the office buildings have their lights on to celebrate the first night game in the history of the World Series. Here on the banks of the Monongahela, the Alleghenies, they join to form the Ohio River. And you're moving now into one of the most beautiful new parks in baseball, Three River Stadium. But above all, the 71 series was a showcase for Roberto Clemente, who hit safely in every game, batted 414, and was named MVP. I mean, even a blind person could clearly see what, uh, what was shining out there, and it was Roberto. Two doubles, a triple, two home runs, four RBIs. Clemente put on one of the most outstanding performances in World Series history. And not just at the plate, but in the field as well. Long chase for Clemente. Gallops over. Grabs it. Whirls. Here's Rettman coming to throw. What a throw! And he just beat it in. The first World Series night game was an opportunity for Clemente to display his talents to a larger audience. And he went three for four while 21-year-old rookie Bruce Keeson allowed just one hit over six and a third innings of relief as the Bucks tied the series at two games apiece. Nellie Bryles got the nod to start game five and came through with a sensational two-hit shutout that gave the Bucks a three-game sweep at Three Rivers. Bryles on the one-two, set throws. Here's the ground trickler, well inside the bag at third. Pagan throws the second. The ball game is over. Pagan gets the fourth. Back to Baltimore for game six, which the O's won three to two in ten innings to set the stage for a final confrontation. And once again, Steve Blass took the mound for the Pirates. I went out to, to pitch in the bottom of the first inning, and I was all over the place because I wasn't locked in at all. It was just, it was just, uh, I was, everything was registering, everything was occurring, and you can't really be too effective. But that's when Earl Weaver tried his psychological ploy and come out and said, Rule 801. 801. Rule 801 says he's got to take his, he's got to pitch from in front, on the rubber in front, and not on the side. And I think I got so upset with him trying that nickel and dime stuff that it gave me a sense to settle down and, and forget about uh, all the circumstances around. And after that, uh, really did get back into it and got back in the groove and, and went from there and really pitched effectively after that. Blass went the distance, allowing just four hits as the Pirates took it two to one for the fourth world championship in their history. And of course, Clemente had a hand in the victory. That is hit well. A Clemente home run, and the Pirates lead one to nothing. That's his 12th hit. It looked like he had a breaking pitch. You look at Clemente in the 71 World Series. Clemente played baseball like that for 15 years. Roberto was a baseball artist who excelled in every phase of the game. A 317 lifetime hitter and a four-time batting champ, Clemente was often misunderstood, but not by those who knew him. I just cherish those 10 years that I had a chance to rub shoulders with him. Um, he taught me so much about the game, and a lot of my teaching is a result of his teaching. When he became more established in his own mind as a top performer, then he looked around and knew that he could help others. He helped the young players in particular, but more than anything else, he helped the young Latins. His, his feelings and commitments were way beyond the paycheck. They were to the Pirates, to the fans of Pittsburgh, and to our family and to the organization. Clemente played right field like an instrument, winning 12 straight gold gloves, and his throwing arm was legendary. Over 18 seasons, he played in more games, batted more times, and got more hits than any other Pirate ever. And his final base hit made history. Bobby hits a drive into the gap in the left center field. There she is. Just three months after reaching 3,000 career hits, Clemente's life tragically ended. Clemente, a perennial star with the Pittsburgh Pirates, died when the plane loaded with relief supplies for earthquake survivors in Managua, Nicaragua, 
plunged into the ocean seconds after takeoff, Clemente was in charge of the earthquake relief drive in Puerto Rico. After his death on New Year's Eve 1972, Clemente received special induction into the Hall of Fame. Roberto was gone, but the Bucks kept winning. In all, they captured five division crowns in the first six years of the 70s, propelled by an awesome offense that came to be known throughout baseball as the Lumber Company. Well, right now, Oliver is in a very key situation. Slow pause to the belt, the pitch. And there's a ball hit very deep to right field. You can't kiss it goodbye. working. Sandhead swings at the drive down the left field line and it's going to twist away down. Certainly did a tremendous job. Stargell gets Goodwood on this one chasing Sato back to the fence. Ronnie looks. A home run for Stargell. Just say goodbye. Well, what'd you hear me say? He give it and he take it. But with success came sadness when Danny Murtaugh died in 76. I think Murtaugh probably was one of the greatest managers in baseball, and a lot of people don't know it. But Murtaugh, he could get the most out of his talent. I mean, that's that's what, what a manager should do. He was smarter like a fox. He really was. Danny, the only thing I didn't like about Danny, he, he had spit tobacco on my shoes. That's the only thing I didn't like. <laughs> if you think of Danny Murtaugh and don't smile, then you don't know him at all. Also in 76, Joe Brown retired as general manager closing out a glorious chapter in pirate history. In 1977, Pittsburgh was in the midst of exciting change, and so were the Pirates. Through an unusual trade with the Oakland A's, the team acquired manager Chuck Tanner, a Newcastle native with baseball savvy and boundless enthusiasm. Pitcher John Candelaria was just one part of a solid nucleus of players that Tanner inherited. Another was 1978 MVP Dave Parker, and in 79, the Pirates won 98 games to reclaim the division crown. The Batland Bucks of 79 were inspired by the gold cap stars of Willie Stargell and the raucous rhythms of Sister Sledge. We about it and look back you know that the star was a big help although the star never got a hit but all the players wanted them and Willie would pass them out and then also the we are family uh, was another big thing that uh, kind of kept the team together through adversities no adversities in the playoffs as Pittsburgh swept the Reds three straight Once again, it was Earl Weaver's Orioles providing opposition as the 79 series began in Baltimore. Four more for the four games you're going to win to win the 1979 Fall Classic. But the Bucks lost game one, five to four. In game two, the score was tied in the ninth with catcher Ed Ott on second base. Tanner called on Manny Sanguian to pinch hit, and Sangi came through in the clutch to deliver the go-ahead run. The O's were finished because Kent DeCulvey was just getting started. In the tradition of Elroy Face and Dave Justy, DeCulvey was a first-class bullpen stopper. He collected three saves against the O's, including this one, which tied the series at a game apiece. The scene shifted to Pittsburgh, 
where the O's won the next two games to take what appeared to be an insurmountable lead. But the Pirate family pulled together after tragedy struck the Tanner family. We were down three to one, and my mother was very sick, and she died. And I kept managing, and I told the players that we needed some extra help, so she was going upstairs to give us that little extra push. Had to be tearing him down, but you would never know it. And he made one statement that his mother would have wanted him to be there and want the Pirates to come back and win. And then that sent a chill through all of us. Starting pitcher Jim Rooker responded with five innings of three-hit ball, while the offense pounded out 13 hits and pulled away to a 7-1 victory. The series would indeed return to Baltimore. The O's were brought down in game six after Dave Parker pounded one of his 10 series hits. Pittsburgh trying to build up a threat here in the top of the seventh inning in a scoreless ball game. And Parker hits it sharply. Second base ball past him. That'll score Moreno. Omar coming around third, and he comes to the plate for the first run of the ball game. The Bucks got three more, and John Candelaria combined with Ticulby to keep Baltimore off the board. Our pitching really did it for us. Our pitching was just fantastic, and then Stargell hit the big home run in the seventh game with Robinson on, and, uh, and then the celebration started, and then we were the city of champions. That McGregor changeup that you've seen so much up tonight. Hit well, right field. Singleton to the wall, and this ball is gone. Willie Stargell, the big man. Seven times he had come to the plate in this series with runners. The Bucks added two more runs in the ninth, and with two outs, Tacoby put the finishing touch on a classic come from behind world championship. Kelly hits it in the air, center field. Moreno going toward right center makes the catch. Pittsburgh wins it. And so this team, with its remarkable comeback capacity throughout the entire regular season, proved itself all... The Pittsburgh Pirates of 1979 were an unusual breed of individuals that would uh, just scrap and scrape and never gave up. And it proved in the finals when everybody thought that uh, Baltimore was the better team, and maybe they were the better team. I don't know, but I know we got the ring. Thanks mostly to the man called Pops. MVP of the series and playoffs and co-MVP of the regular season, Stargell brought the Bucks home to our royal welcome and returned the tribute in kind. We feel that you people are just as responsible for our winning as we are. Pittsburgh is a big family. Stargell helped keep the Bucks aloft for three more seasons. But at the end of 1982, one of the classiest men in baseball bid farewell after 20 years. He had touched the entire city, and it was clear that Pittsburgh had touched him. There's no greater joy, and I may sound like a broken record. I come in last night, or early this morning, in through the tunnels, and this city opened up with its arms, and I felt at home. I can't even begin to tell you what this hour has meant. What we need in this game of baseball in Pittsburgh was fortunate to have the honor to have a Willie Stargell representing Pittsburgh through the years that he was with them. And uh, there's no finer person on the field and off the field than Willie Stargell. And nobody that ever played the game could hit the ball as hard or as far. Nobody. New young stars began to emerge, but turmoil both on and off the field sent the Pirates into a tailspin. And in 1985, all of Pittsburgh was saddened by the death of Bob Prince. Voice of the Bucks for almost 30 years, the Gunners' unique style earned him a place in the Hall of Fame. Maz driving deep left field and it stays fair. Get going, get going, and kiss it goodbye. We got him, we got him, we got him. And the Pirates are the National League Eastern Division champions. And you may have some chicken on a hill with Will. I broadcast Major League Baseball for 30 years with a lot of different people. But I wouldn't trade the 12 years with Bob Prince and the Pittsburgh Pirates for all the rest of them put together. Then, still more distressing news. The Galbraiths decided to sell the franchise. And it seemed the city would lose it. 
but Pittsburgh united to save the battling bucks. We had to do something ourselves to keep the team here. And that's when I decided that the city itself had to get involved with the purchase of the team uh, by putting some sort of a formula together, being a public-private partnership. Time and time again, that community has come forward in when, the, when, this, uh, when our uh, Western Pennsylvania or Pittsburgh generally has, has needed it and has done the things necessary to, uh, to make uh, major contributions to our, to our lifestyle, which uh, ends up being a number one most livable city. Pittsburgh has a noble tradition of public and private sectors coming together in time of need. They did it again to save the pirates, and with good reason, because for a hundred years, this team has been a unifying force in a city of vast diversity, and a major league city deserves a major league team. 1987 marks the 100th anniversary of Major League Baseball in Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh Pirates have provided the city of Pittsburgh and the surrounding areas with many championship teams and many, many superstars. The 1987 Pittsburgh Pirates under manager Jim Leland is committed to a new beginning for the next 100 years of successful baseball for the Pittsburgh area. Just as our grandparents passed on the pirate tradition to our parents and they to us, so too should our children and their children have that privilege. So a hundred years from now, somebody else will be standing here next to old Hannes, telling about the stars of 1993 and 2021 and 2068. If the past hundred years are any indication, there sure is a lot to look forward to in the century to come. to the winners lift up the glasses here's to the glory still to be here's to the battle whatever it's for to ask the best of ourselves Then give much more Here's to the heroes Those who move mountains Here's to the miracles They make us see Here's to the 